So we're going to be in Revelation chapter 11 tonight. Once we get hooked up. Um, you know. Yeah, I've been thinking about something over the last few days. It, I've really kind of struggled with over the years with you know how the calling I, I was very grateful like the call I, I don't want to get into too much detail because I'll keep you here all night and I know that's not cool. uh, really kind of like where I am now I'm not saying he's not going to continue to change me and grow me because I'm always about growing and being challenged to grow and whatnot but I realize now that kind of like where I am now is where God always wanted to bring me and you know one of the things that God showed me here recently was is that he's called me to be used to help disciple people Amen. To work with him and discipling people. And one of the things that I know about the way that I preach and teach is that there's a lot of information that comes out of me. Can I tell you that I have prayed before and said, Lord, if it's not your will for all this information and all this stuff to come out of my mouth, please do something about it. And uh, I just really believe that that the Lord wants to. This is how God has chosen to use me for me to learn and to study and to leave every. Not, don't leave any stones unturned and to find out and then it is hopefully by the grace of God it flows out um, but one of the one of the things that I want to share with you is this is that in my opinion my humble opinion people that love the Lord and that the Spirit of God lives on the inside of them should love his word amen and so therefore whether or not you know if you feel like the information is repetitive or not that shouldn't matter you should, if the Spirit of God is on the inside of you, when you hear the word of the Lord, hallelujah, reach your ears, something ought to be happening on the inside of you, amen? I mean, if the Spirit of God's involved in it at all, something ought to be happening on the inside of you. You should be feeling it, but if, but if you don't feel it, you fret not. You know what part of the problem is when we don't feel it is either, number one, we're not saved. See, the Word of God says that the natural mind, that means the man that is unsaved. What does it mean to be saved? It means the first time you were born of Adam, according to the Bible, you were born in sin, you were born a sinner, and you were dead to God, period. Yes, your little life, the doctor might have spanked your booty, and he made you take your first breath, and you started crying, and you started breathing, and you had physical air in your lungs, but guess what? You didn't have no spiritual life on the inside of you. And so until you get born again, according to the word of God, you're dead to the things of God. Right. And when you're dead to the things of God, you cannot appreciate the things of God. But once you get born again, that's the first step in the journey. To receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Amen. And when you do that, how do I do that, preacher? Well, first off, you got to realize that you're a sinner. Amen. First off, you got to realize you're a sinner. And that, and that Jesus died for your sin. Amen. Praise God. Jesus died for your sin. And what he wants you to do, what he wants you to understand is, is that in order for you to get saved is that you have to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Praise God. And whatever you do, a supernatural miracle takes place on the inside of you. Hallelujah. Everybody saved in here tonight? Amen. Amen. If you're not saved, you can be. But first, you know, in order for a person to be saved, they got to realize that they need, what do I need saving from? Well, we're going to talk about it tonight. There's a real devil. If there's a real God, if, I love it. I love talking to people that don't believe in God. I do it all the time. Every opportunity I get, I love it. I like the ones that are smart. Come on, give me the stuff. I like the ones that even worship the devil, the Wiccans and the, and the Muslims and the Buddhists. I know, and most of the time, and I'm not saying this to pat myself on the back, I done studied their stuff more than they know their own stuff. Because that's how much I like talking. So, like, let's talk about. It. Let's talk about. It. And I and I gotta tell you that if that if that if you hadn't gotten saved, hallelujah, what you need is the Lord, Amen. And and, and I just want to encourage you to know that uh, that praise God, God loves you, man, and He wants to do a work in your heart and in your life, Amen. All right, let's pray. I mean, let's 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 read. Let's, that's what I want. So here's the chapter. Y'all ready? And there was given me a read. Like unto a rod. And the angels stood saying, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court, which is without the temple, leave out and, the me and measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles. Now, real quick, for some of you may not even know, what is a Gentile? 
Well, according to the Old Testament, sometimes the word Gentile is used. Sometimes the word heathen is used. That's talking about everybody that doesn't know God. Now, in today's society, how you would view that, there's a lot of people that say they know God. Amen? You, you know what I'm saying? As a matter of fact, they do this Gallup poll every year. And they say, they ask people, how many people are Christians? How many people are Muslims in America? And almost every year, like clockwork, 85% of people say that they're Christians. But I'm telling you right now, if you talk to 85% of people on the street, the reason they're saying they're Christians is because their mom and daddy were either Catholic or their mom and daddy were this or their mom and daddy were that. And so they uh, identify. Oh, that's a good word to use in today's society. I identify as Christian. But that's not how it works in Christianity. That's not how it works in the kingdom of God. You don't just identify because your mom or your daddy were a Christian. I've said it before. God doesn't have grandchildren. No. You must come to the realization that you need the Lord for yourself. So anyway, I was on a rabbit trail. The Gentiles or the heathen in the Old Testament were all those nations that did the Old Testament. Syria, Babylon, Greece, Rome. Right in America, in the world today, we could say places like India, and China, as a nation at that time, because see, there were there were individual believers, but God recognized Himself through a people called Israel. Israel was His nation today that don't really know God. People say all the time that they know the Lord, but in reality, today, if you're not born again, if you're not saved, if the Holy, if you have not bowed your knee to Jesus, so to speak, and said, "Lord, I realize I'm a sinner." I was born in sin, and I need to be born again. Amen? And Lord, I believe you died on the cross for my sins. Amen? And, I, and I'm asking you, I'm inviting you to come into my heart. I know, Lord, I, I believe this story now. And if you don't believe it, then you're not going to pray it. You shouldn't pray it if you don't believe it. But my prayer for you is that one day you would believe it enough to where you say, Yes, Lord! I, I believe it. Come into my heart and forgive me of my sin. Forgive me and come to live in me. And I'm telling you right now, when you pray that prayer from a heart that means business with God, he knows it and he moves in and you ain't never going to be the same. Amen. Oh, everything's going to be perfect. I'm praying, no, 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 no. As a matter of fact, that's when the war begins. In your individual life, that's when the war begins. The enemy wants to destroy it. But praise God. God is not going to let you be destroyed. Amen. He loves you. Praise God. So it is given unto the Gentiles. And the holy city shall they tread underfoot. The holy city is Jerusalem. Forty and two months. And we've already talked about that before. But how long is 42 months? It's half of seven years. It's 3.5 years. Three and a half years. It's also known as 1260 days. So the Gentiles are going to tread underfoot the city of Jerusalem. Forty-two months. And I will give power unto my two witnesses. And they shall prophesy a thousand two. That's 1260 days. That's King James language, three score. A score is 20, three score is 60, 1260 days. And they're going to do this clothed in sackcloth. Now, I didn't really put a whole lot of information. Well, let me just keep reading. Now, we'll get to it. These are the two olive trees, and the two will hurt them. He must, in this manner, be killed. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. And have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. You know, let me just say a little something right here. Does this not sound, this sound like a sci-fi movie almost, right? I mean, if we're real with each other, come on. Dudes yeah. blowing fire out of their mouth. Come on, really? People turning water into blood. Come on, man. Plagues, really? Okay, but what I want you to know is this, is that the enemy of your soul. So again, I use the conjunction if when I talk to people that don't know the Lord. That's how I, I lost my train of thought. And so when I talk to people that don't know the Lord, I invite that situation. But if there is a real God, again, I'm convinced, but in case somebody on video is not convinced, if God is real, then guess what? Their devil's also real. The Word of God says that there's a real God and there's a real devil. He's the antithesis of God. He's the enemy of God. He's contrary to God. All right? And... And, you know, the enemy of God, he's not dumb. That's one of the things that I've learned. He's a very intelligent creature. He's very, very smart. He's much smarter than any human being ever could be. And he's been watching human behavior for thousands of years. He knows you like a book. He knows me like a book. And, and, and he knows 
God's word like a book. And he knows God because he's seen him before. And he was cast out of his presence. So, so the point that I'm trying to make is this. Is that the enemy changes tactics. You know what the Bible says? God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God never changes. That's the beauty of walking with the Lord and him. But the enemy is ever changing his tactics. And that some of his tactics are the same old tired stuff. But what I'm trying to say is he disguises it. The, the age that we live in today is intellectualism. We live in the midst of a society where everything is, is intellectual and logical. And whenever you see these kinds of concepts here, oh yeah, right, somebody's going to turn blood, water into blood. Oh, somebody's going to blow fire out of their mouth like a dragon. Yeah, dragons were real too, right? Okay, whatever. Okay, but what I'm trying to tell you is this, is that there's going to be a day when this is going to happen. I don't care how smart you think you are. Amen. If you have not given your heart to the Lord and you hadn't died because you were left behind, God will show up. And just as he did it in the time of old, he's going to do it again. And then there's going to, uh, then listen, mouths are going to be shut at that point in time. People are going to be in awe of the Lord. When the wrath of God starts to hit folks and them scorpions start to sting folks and people are in pain from the demonic presence that is darkened over their life, there ain't going to be no more questions then. Right now it's easy to not believe in God. Right now it's easy to continue to walk the pathway that you choose to walk. But I'm here to tell you, when this shows up, it ain't going to be easy anymore. There's going to be sorrow and heartache and wailing and gnashing of teeth. It's going to be sadness and crying. Good news, though, you don't have to face that. If you just give your heart to the Lord, amen. I'm not trying to scare you in anything, because if i got to scare you to come in, I'm going to have to scare you. But Jesus preached on hell. He said it's a place where the, where the fire is not quenched and the worm dies not. Think about that. You want, you want to lay in a bed full of worms? The worm dies not, and there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth is going to be bad, my friend. There's going to be a day whenever just these witnesses are going to do all of this. It's going to happen. There's going to be a lot of supernatural things happening. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city. Now we're talking about Jerusalem here. No, this is the last three. Okay. In this, you're already gone, sister. Huh? But you're already gone, but don't take a nap because right. the people that you work with, there's still some people you work with that, that, right? That they might end up here. If they don't give their heart to Jesus and the people that you knock on their door, amen? I mean, that's reality. Don't go to sleep on me because there's souls out there that hang in the balance. Amen. I mean, really, we need to pray, Lord, cause my soul. Spirit man to be awakened, cause a fire to burn in my bones, or let me go to sleep on this. Let me not forget the severity of judgment on those that don't know you, right? Thank you for that. That's a good question. So this place, Jerusalem, which is the city of God, which really is, the word literally means peace. Jerusalem means peace. Shalom. Look at it. Spiritually, it's called Sodom and Egypt. Where our Lord was crucified. But there's a lot that could be said there. Maybe we'll make it before we. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues. I want you to kind of notice this. And we'll get back to it again. And not, you know what? I'm going I'm to bring you somewhere. But look. They of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations. Shall see their dead bodies three days and a half. And shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. This is after the witnesses die. And look. They that dwell upon the earth. Same people. Shall rejoice over them and make merry. They're going to be happy. They shall send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. The whole time they're sitting there and they're preaching and they're prophesying about the things of God as all of this wrath is being poured out. But yet it was tormenting them because they couldn't kill them. Right? The word of God says that God was protecting them and they couldn't kill them. Can I tell you that God has always had a witness in the land? I've said this before. I'm not going to go off on my rabbit trail, but I want you to know God has always had a witness in the way. It didn't matter where I was. When I was, in juvenile, when I was a juvenile delinquent and I was in detention home in Lafayette, showed up. Here he comes. The man comes walking up in there with his Bible and says, anybody need to hear about the Lord? And I'm like, well, my sister's a Christian. Why don't you go ahead and tell me what you got? Then I get out. What do I do? I go back to my same old thing. Let's do our thing. Stealing people's bicycles, smoking weed, drinking, chasing girls, do all this. Oh, it's so fun. And then the next thing you know, boom, now you're in rehab. 
Sure enough, here he comes. Here comes that Baptist. Don't be hating on the Baptist, because sure enough, evangelical, he shows up with his Bible. He says, but what about the Lord? And every time, everywhere I went, never failed, the Lord sent somebody as a witness. And that's just my little old life. In your life, too, the Lord has sent a witness to you. And the Lord will always have a witness in the land to speak the truth. And even in this time, this is God's mercy, my friend. He's still going to sit here and tell people the truth about the kingdom of God, about the truth of God, even though people have rejected him and gone in an opposite direction. But I wanted you to see something. The people on the earth, I wanted you to see these words. They of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall, shall see their dead body. They won't even allow their bodies to be put in the grave. And I wanted to bring it to this scripture real quick in Revelation chapter 5 verse 9. Because I wanted you to see this. Look, and they say, now this is, a, this is the same description of people, but it's a different atmosphere. And they, sung, who, the, who's they? The people in heaven. And they sung a new song saying, you are worthy to take the book to open the seals thereof for you were slain and has redeemed us. You bought us back to God. How did you buy us back? Through your blood, talking about the cross, out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. You know, today I would just want y'all to know, I'll just get on y'all and get on myself, but I got on my daughter early. For, I'm not going to say the whole, all the details, but something happened and I was like, dude, really? You ain't like the world. And I said, hold on, I'm preaching it tonight. Let me show you every tongue, kindred, people, nation here and then also here. And I believe what the Lord wants us to realize is this, is that uh, what the Lord wants us to realize is that, guess what? They got basically what we're looking at here is that, that there's people that are in the world and they don't want to go and follow God's ways. Every tongue, kindred and nation and tribe, and then there's the people of God. Every tongue, kindred, nation, and tribe. What is he talking about? He's talking about the mass of the world. And within the mass of the world, we see two types of people. And we see those that are following after God, and we see those that are not following after God. And like I told her, and I'm going to tell you, you're going to have to make a decision. Amen. At some point in time, you have to make a decision, my friend. On who you're going to serve. And don't pretend to yourself that you're serving God if you're not. Amen? Amen? Praise God. And so, there they are. And they're making fun. And look, they're rejoicing over it. I'm probably getting ahead of myself, so I won't hit, hit, hit it twice. I remember whenever the, the Twin Towers thing fell. And whatever you think of that, you know, we don't have time to get into all that. But nevertheless, what the narrative we were told was that it was the Islamic terror. And so what happened, if you'll remember on TV, whether or not it was prepared and whatever, I don't know. But they showed all the people burning American flags and hooting and hollering in the street. And the great serpent is, we cut the head off the great serpent. I don't know if y'all remember that or not. But all that was going on. This is a similar type concept. Whenever these people, like the whole world is seeing this and some, you know, people can see all this stuff now. And they're rejoicing over. Because, because they hate God and they don't want to serve the Lord. See, right now it's easy not it's easy to just not to be indifferent. I don't well, I don't believe in him. I don't and I don't love him, but I don't hate him either. It's easy right now. <laughs> but you get stuck in a bind and you don't soften your heart towards God, it's gonna get ugly, right? And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, come up hither, uh, come up here. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud and their enemies beheld them. And the same hour was there a great earthquake and the 10th part of the city fell. And in the earthquake were slain of men 7,000 and the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven. Now look, th that's kind of like the first time that that passage, I've read the book of Revelation so many times. And that one little verse right there. Let me see if I can do that. Let's see if I can do this real quick. This verse right here. This part of this verse. This clause. Yeah. The remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven. I never noticed that before. This is after the rapture. This is in the midst of the last three and a half years. This is, uh, this is in the time frame of wrath. And... There's a remnant of people, even then, that were so fearful, let's see what the word says, thrown into fear, terrified, 
trembling that they gave glory to the God of heaven. I don't know that that means that they all got saved. I'm, that's not what I'm trying to say. But what I'm trying to say is, is that they're recognizing God. They've been provoked by fear to give glory to God. I don't know what I don't know what it looks like. It's about to be the end, and I'm going to show you that through the message tonight. But basically, you know what the Bible says? Listen, I love this scripture. The Bible says this, that there's coming a day when every knee will bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Think about that. There's coming a day when it's going to happen, my friend. Now, I don't know about you, but I've come to the persuasion or the conclusion that guess what? And I used to say this to the Lord all, all the time. And I don't know if it's because it sounded good, because it rhymed. I want to bow now. Bow now. I want to bow now, Lord. I want to bow my life to you, my knee to you, my heart to you. I want to confess you as Lord right now. I don't want to wait until everybody else plans to do it. Amen? Amen. 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 That should be the prayer of our heart if we're going to be servants of the Lord. Yeah. Amen? Amen? The second woe is past, and behold, the third woe comes quickly. The seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven. So I want you to see that. Look, the seventh angel sounded. You see, this, oh, yeah, I want you to see, I want you to see a couple things. I'm going to just go through a couple other translations real quick. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet. That's the ESV, uh, the NASV. Then the seventh angel sounded. Okay, so he says sounded too there. Let's see what the, I know y'all don't like the NIV, but let's just see what it said. The seventh angel sounded his trumpet. Okay, so you see, no question, because we've been on the seventh angels of the trumpets and now what we're being told here is that the seventh angel is sounding his trumpet and look what he says and the seventh angel sounded and there were great voices in heaven saying the kingdoms of this world are become so the idea in the language is I don't I'm, I don't know if we even have this in English but I think in the Greek it'd be what you call pluperfect which means it's now happened and it's in its final it's like it's happening, but it's got an end result to it. So the kingdoms of this world are become. They're currently, as we're speaking, they are becoming the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. See, it's important that you understand that there's a lot of concepts out there and a lot of truth to it. That while Jesus has already defeated the powers of death, hell, and the grave, it's true. Jesus said it is finished. His resurrection shows us that he has power over death and sin. But then some people would say, well, why is there, why is there such chaos on the earth, right? Why, why are there pedophiles on the earth? Why does God allow people to get away with these things? Why, do, why was this man who seemed like he was such a man of God treating doing weird things to kids. Why, you know, right? Why do, why do we see people that are, that are clergy doing weird stuff to kids? I mean, it's the worst thing you can think of, right? Why, why, why do all these things happen? Why did that person just, I saw, was watching Fox News and some dude just punched some four-year-old kid in the face and the mama tackled him and it restrained him to the police got him. But, but anyway, yeah, don't mess with that mama, bro. But anyway, <laughs> why are people so messed up? Why, why would, why, how could God be real? And then if he's real, how could he be loved? Don't blame that on God. When God created this place, according to his word, this place was perfect and pristine and was without sin. No man disobeyed God. Man continues to disobey God. And man continues to be led astray by the lies of Satan. Amen. That's right. And the time is not completed yet. Jesus has already defeated evil on the cross. But guess what? There's coming a day when he is going to rule and reign upon this earth. And everybody's going to know he's king. And I've already said it many times over the last month. There's going to be a change in the atmosphere. <laughs> Hallelujah. It's no longer going to be the spirit of Antichrist that's causing all this chaos. No, no, no. He's going to be shut up in the, in the bottomless pit for a thousand years. And guess what? The spirit that's going to be prevalent on the earth is the spirit of the Christ, right. which means the anointed one, which means the one that God always promised. And we get a picture out of Isaiah, and it says, the lion will eat straw like an ox. You'd be able to go pet a lion. Right? <laughs> the, 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 the wolf and the lamb will lie together. And a child can put his hand on a snake's hole. Because the spirit of the Lord is going to be all over. It's going to be in the air. It's going to be a beautiful thing. So it hadn't happened yet. It hadn't come to its finality. You need to remember that. 
The other day somebody told me, I was talking to somebody, they said, who's your pastor? I said, you told me they don't have nothing to do with my pastor. The only thing your pastor does is that hopefully he stimulates your appetite to learn more. Amen. Right? They wanted to know who her pastor was because she knew more about the Bible than him and he was a pastor. <laughs> I just thought that's my thing. All right, but but it's but it's not nothing to do with your pastor. And hopefully, we all have an appetite to learn. Yes. Amen. All right, Christ and He shall reign forever. And the four and twenty-four elders which sat uh, before on God on their seats. That you know, this is another thing I just noticed today. Let's go ahead and highlight. It. Here we go. And the twenty-four elders, y'all working with me? Fell upon their faces. Y'all, see, if your brain may not work like mine, and hopefully, it never does because sometimes I wonder <laughs> if it's a good thing. But I notice all these little details. And, and this is how I think. Because you remember we've been having this conversation about pre-trib, mid-trib, whatever we want to call it. Mid-seventh week, you know, da-da-da. And, and one of the arguments of the pre-trib rapture camp is that John is a type of the church that's raptured. And that the 24 elders are a type, right, of, uh, I don't even know if what I'm saying is going to make sense. So let me just shut up before I keep going. All right. Saying we give the thanks, O Lord. Well, you know what? I will say this. Well, no. Because I don't think I was even thinking right. I'm going to be admit to you. Transparency. I don't think I was thinking right. Okay. Here we go. <laughs> Saying we give thee thanks, O Lord, God Almighty, which art and was and art to come. And you don't have to cut that out, Danielle. You can leave it in there so people know. <laughs> because thou hast taken to thee your great power and you have reigned. And the nations were angry. And your wrath is come in the time of the dead that they should be judged, that you should give reward unto your servants, the prophets. Isn't that a beautiful thing too? Let me just keep going. Give a reward to your servants, the prophets, to the saints, and them that fear your name, small and great, and should destroy them which destroy the earth. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings. And an earthquake and great hail. I'm not going to go, when I, when I get into the little message part that I'm about to do, I'm going to kind of like leave off these last few verses. But, but, but so because I'm going to do that, I want, I want us to look at this for a quick second. The nations were angry. If you were taking t notes, I guarantee you, you could go to Psalm chapter 2. And it describes the kings of the earth coming against God and his anointing. Okay. And, you, and your wrath has come. So, you know, the nations are angry with God in his plan. In the time of the dead that they should be judged. There's coming a time when grace is going to run out and evil, wicked humanity is going to be judged. And that you should give reward to your servants. Amen? There's going to come a day whenever the wicked world is going to be judged and God's servants are going to be rewarded. The prophets of old, the saints, that's talking about you and I. I you hope you know that. And them that fear your name, small and great, and should destroy them which destroy the earth. That's the part I wanted you to see right there. And, and, and should destroy them which destroy the earth. You know, people, people have often said, how can you serve a God that, that destroys people? You know, you remember those passages in the Old Testament? And I had such a hard time with them for a long time. And now I just feel so good that the Lord revealed to me. Where the Lord said, when I bring you in there, I want you to kill them all. I want you to kill the women, the children. I want you to kill their animals. And you know what the person that doesn't believe in God says? Oh, how can you love a God like that? Especially in today's society, right? Everybody's all about love. It, can I tell you this? It's a fake love. It's not a real love. All that gooey, gooey, ooey, gooey, snickerdoodle love that they're talking about out there, that's not real love. No, that's some kind of ooey gooey type of love that's a fake love that wants to come against true love because true love is going to tell somebody the word of the Lord says homosexuality is wrong. The word of the, just, oh preacher, you don't love homosexuals? No, that's not even true. I love homosexuals. See, you don't know nothing about me. I don't have time to tell you about me. Okay, but when I'm, I was never a homosexual. I will say that, but I love homosexuals. I used to not like being around homosexuals. But now I... Amen. I'll tell him straight up Jesus loves him and I'll hug him. Yeah. Amen. Because he needs to know about the love of the Lord. Right. And his sin is no worse than the sin that I would have. Right. Right. Amen. But it's sin. Yeah. But now we're trying to say that it's love and that it's normal behavior. And that's not what the word. I 
identify as. You know, they just had on Fox News the other day, some dude when he was 18 molested a young girl, and then now he's saying, I identify as a woman. Okay, so that whenever they put his, put his honey in prison, and he was bragging about the fact that he was going to get away with it because they were charging him as, as a juvenile and, you know, all this other kind of stuff. Wickedness! Sickness! And the laws are, are allowing it to happen. Yeah, we need to wake up, church. Yep. We need to quit being naive and, and, and believing all of this garbage out there. I've talked to Christians recently. They're like, But it seems like they love each other. Let me tell you something. You ever thought that maybe a demon spirit can masquerade, a, a lustful spirit can masquerade as love? He's an, he presents himself like an angel of light. All kind of people think that they love each other. Is it really love? I, I, I don't know. I know that the love of God is love. God is love. So if it looks like God is love, if it don't look like God, it ain't love. That's all I know. Amen. And the temple of God was open. So anyway, what was my point? <laughs> destroy them which destroy the earth. In that passage of scripture, the people were Nephilim. Okay, well, what is that? Go home and tell your friend tonight. It, it, it's a, it was an ungodly seed. They were purposefully set up on the earth by Satan himself. He perverted the human race. They had this wicked seed in them. God said, kill them all. That's why he said that. Because listen, do you realize that there's still Satanists on the earth? And it's not like my little friend Tim Bob burns into, you know, and all this kind of stuff. No, these are people that are powerful. <laughs> these are people that they have the power to rule the world. They're the richest people in the world. And they're behind Jeffrey Epstein. Hello? We sit there and we watch news. Oh, Jeffrey Epstein got busted and he was on an, uh, he was on a, he had an island and he was flying everybody in there and all of a sudden he killed himself. Well, how did he get a rope, number one, or however he did it? How did he, how did he do it? No, 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 no. Um, it, that, that, all that stuff, all that pedophilia, Satanism. Yeah. Come on, you got to see it for what it is. And it's not by Tim Bob doing it. It's by the rich, the wealthy, the powerful. Why? Because it's called occult magic and they're doing weird stuff on the earth and they're trying to bring forth their plan. You got to be able to see it. They're trying to bring forth their plan and so they offer weird pseudo, that's what I call him, Satan. Believe me, he's really weird. They do weird stuff to the weirdo and somehow because their free wills interconnected to him, they, his spirits work on the earth and they actually get stuff accomplished. Can, can I dare to say that they're getting a lot more accomplished than your average Christian? Because yeah, we're so busy sitting on the couch. Come on, let me go ahead and preach it. Busy sitting on the couch, serving ourselves instead of serving the Lord. Help us, Lord, is all I'm saying. I'm not fussing at you. I love you. I appreciate the fact that you keep coming back. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in this temple the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake. Oh, here we go. <laughs> This thing said, dude, you would spend way too much time talking. <laughs> way too much time talking. All right. Let's see. Here we go. All right. Let's get into the message. <laughs> really? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Really? All right. Here we go. Okay. Now, the only people left at this time, you and I are gone. The only people that are left this time are the Jew or Jewish people. Okay, who God's going to judge the majority of them because they're not, they have not received Jesus. If y'all think that the Jews that are alive today are, you know, they've rejected Jesus. You understand that? Now, the Jews that have accepted Christ are true believers, but those that have rejected Christ, that's not God's people. God's people are those that have Jesus living in their heart. Amen. God's not done with Israel. That's not what I'm saying. But in this time frame, it's almost like God's saying, measure the temple, measure the altar, measure them that worship within there. It's almost like he's saying, okay, now who's with me? That's what I, that's what I get out of it. Now who's with me? Because I'm about to bring it all to an end. Okay, and, and, and he's wanting to know who is with him. And in the backstage of all of this chapter right here, in this last three and a half years, we see the two witnesses as center stage. Amen. And this time ends with the last trumpet. Y'all remember that? When, when we read that in the chapter just now, it said the, in the seventh angel sounded his trumpet. And then it says, and the kingdoms of, our, of, of this world have become, are become. The kingdoms of our God. Now, last week, whenever I showed you on my little PowerPoint, I said, trumpet one, vial one, trumpet two, vial two, trumpet three, vial three, da-da-da, all the way. I tried to make a point. 
I'm not trying to say that, oh, definitely they happen in exactly concurrently. That doesn't matter to me. What I'm trying to tell you is there's not a seven year boop, and then pour the vial on earth and this is what's happening. You see, and I showed y'all that maybe they don't all line up exactly, but there's so much similarity between the trumpet and the vial that it's hard to say that they're not interconnected. And in this chapter, let me make it clear. He says, the seventh angel sounded his trumpet and the, ba and the kingdoms of our God, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our God. Amen. Amen. One interesting thing, he said, leave out the court of the Gentiles. It was the whole city was being desecrated by the Gentiles. I think it's interesting that the last, the other time in the Old Testament where the temple of Ezekiel was also measured in chapter 40 through 42. And then in chapter 43, the glory of God returns. And interestingly, in this passage, even though we got a lot of revelation left to cover, you know, it's coming in segments in this chapter's ending, describing the end. The last trumpet is sounding and is, and is describing the end because even the witnesses have died and they've been ascended unto God. And they were prophesying for that last three and a half years. It's talking about the last three and a half years. And in Ezekiel, the glory of God comes back when the temple's measured. And in this case, the temple's being measured. And guess what? Jesus is about to return. Amen. So let's talk a little bit about the two witnesses. Have y'all studied the two witnesses before? I know some of y'all in here have. Amen. Now, one of the things that I, I just love the fact that God has placed witnesses on this earth. And I'm just so love the fact that God has given me a desire to be a witness for him. And I know that many of you, I have not found greater joy in my life. And I know I'll say this and I don't mean to be a broken record. I done jumped off a bungee cords. Uh, you know, I've done so, I'm like an adrenaline. Used by God. And look, I would rather just have a true one-on-one -on -one encounter with somebody and then even preach the gospel. I'm just, no, I love to preach the gospel. I'm talking about when I have a one-on-one -on -one and I know the Lord's flowing, there is nothing yeah. that I've ever felt yeah. in my life that is better yeah. than that moment in time. Yeah. I'm telling you, I know if you've never experienced it, you don't know what I'm talking about, but if you have, you know what I'm talking about. When the Lord opens up a door and you minister Jesus and you get to lay hands on somebody and pray with them, you know at that moment in time that you are fulfilling the purpose that God has for your life. That's the only way to explain it. Amen. Amen. The witnesses. Amen. God's going to keep witnesses on this earth. Praise God. He's going to give power to the witnesses and they're going to witness for 1260 days clothed in sackcloth. I didn't really go to it, but you know, sackcloth is an interesting concept. The Jews would wear sackcloth, kind of like burlap, very uncomfortable. You know, when the Jews repented, I think that this is an interesting concept. They would wear sackcloth, so they'd take their clothes off and they would cover themselves like with a burlap sack. You ever felt, you know what burlap is? And nowadays women use it for their crafts, right? But have you ever just, one day, I mean, not if you're a woman and people are in the house, but, or even if you're a man and people are in the house, but one day rub it all over your skin. Just kind of like stick it up under your shirt and just go ahead and do that. Rub, I dare you, rub that burlap all over your skin. No, I don't want to do that yet because it's uncomfortable. And that's the point. And then they would take ashes and they would rub it all up in their hair and all over their face. I'm sorry, my brain just gets away with me. You know, you imagine, you ever saw that movie Pearl Harbor before? With, what was it, Ben Affleck? Okay. Can you, can you imagine all the explosions going on, right? The concussion of the bombs and people walking around like, like all confused and dirt all They would want to repent. Guess what? Re true repentance. Listen, I'm not trying to say repentance is always emotional. Because look, you can sit here and you can cry your little heart out. And, it, and you, still, it still don't, you still ain't turned, right? But, but true repentance does involve brokenness. It does involve brokenness, and many times there's great emotion connected to it and discomfort. Yeah. Whenever a person truly repents, they're uncomfortable because the Lord has revealed to them that they've been contrary to God. And in, in the Old Testament, it was a type of that. Where they put that burlap on their skin, it's uncomfortable, and they rub that in ashes all over their, all, all over their body. It was uncomfortable. Who, who wants to walk around like that? And here's these two witnesses. This is an uncomfortable time. But the Lord told him to do that. Look, when Jonah went to Nineveh, guess what? The people, the king said, everybody got to put on sackcloth. Put it on the animals. <laughs> you know? All right. So we don't know for sure 
if these two witnesses are Old Testament prophets or not. Okay, if you've studied the witnesses, you've already looked at all this. So this information to me is kind of interesting. Uh, they could be modern men. But the reason why I say that is because the Bible doesn't explicitly tell us who they are. Right? But there's multiple biblical connections that remind us of other specific instances and other biblical characters, right? So let's take a look at some of these things. So first off, how it describes them. Can you see that? It says olive trees. And then it says the two candlesticks. Now, this is a direct reference to Zechariah. We're not going to turn there, but this passage in Zechariah says exactly that. The two of my witnesses, will be, they're the two olive trees. Fruit of olives. What do you get out of an olive? Oil. You get oil. What is an oil a type of? Holy Spirit. The two candlesticks. What does that remind you of? A candlestick. What does that remind you of? What, what is it? It's light, right? Where else do you hear of light or the candlesticks? In the temple. You remember I showed y'all that Sunday? In the temple. And what is the purpose of light? What does the word of God say about light? The word of God, the psalmist David said, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. These two witnesses, full of the Holy Spirit, hallelujah, broadcasting the light of God to tell those that are lost and, and in the midst of darkness, hey, there's a right way. And, and guess what? People are broadcasting it today, but we're just so comfortable because, you know, there's not really, we don't, we're not in sackcloth and ashes yet. It's not really that bad. It's getting pretty bad though, right? I mean, but we still just... Moving around in our little journey. Okay, but let's look at some of the things. So that's who they are, but prevent rain. They can prevent rain. You remember that? That's what it said in the, re in the chapter when I read it. They can prevent rain. Who does that remind you of? Don't yell it out, but just be thinking. Hold on to that. Some of you already know, and y'all are bored, but it's okay. Y'all just hang with me because other people might be learning. and Y'all should be excited, amen? So who prevented rain in the Bible? They turned water to blood. Okay, who did that? Somebody did that. Remember that? We talked about it, right? They smite the earth with all plagues. Somebody did that, right? Y'all remember? And look, they call down that fire proceeds out of their mouth. Somebody, not, I'm not saying anybody ever blew fire out of their mouth, but a prophet in the Old Testament called fire down from heaven, right? So let's look at some of this. So look, Elijah... Mo and Moses versus Enoch. And the reason that I'm mentioning three of these people is, is this. The reality is most commentators, if this is Old Testament uh, characters that God brings back for this time frame, it has to be one of these three. There, it has to two, be two of these three. There, and the reason why is because the evidence is too strong to not be. Right? So look, the, the, the argument for it being Elijah and Enoch is that neither one of them ever died, right? If you read the Bible, Enoch, the Bible says Enoch was, and then he was with God, amen? He walked, and then he was with God. So the Bible says that God took Enoch, and then we don't really hear anything more other than the references to him in the New Testament. Elijah was caught up in a whirlwind in his chariot, right? In the chariot, right? And his mantle fell to the earth, and Elisha picked it up. So Elijah didn't die, Enoch didn't die, and the reason that that's, the, the reason that people talk about that is because the Word of God does say that it's appointed unto man once to die, and then the judgment. Now, you know, so in other words, everybody's got to die, is what the concept is. I mean, it makes sense, but then again, God can do what He wants to do, and, and, and so, but it does make an argument for Enoch. In other words... Enoch and Elijah never died, so therefore they come back to earth, and we heard that the two witnesses died, and they resurrect, right? And then God brings them up to heaven. So that's the argument for Enoch, all right? You may not be able to read this, but it says, Elijah called fire down from heaven, and during his ministry, it didn't rain for three and a half years. Well, that's, now that's it. It's not to rain. And in the New Testament, in Luke and in James, I'm going to go to it. I'm just going to tell you about it. But we didn't even talk about talk, turning the water into blood. Who did that? Moses touched the water with his staff, right? They, we didn't even talk about the fact that they can do call, call down all manner of plagues. Who called on plagues on Egypt, right? Moses did. And so you see the evidences regarding Moses and Elijah also, right? You might need a little bit more evidence, and I get that. I'm going to try to give it to you. But look, I want you to see this, though. 
Well, let's go ahead and go there. This is Luke 9, 30 through 31. Let's go there real quick. Luke 9, 30 through 31. All right? Let's, let's go ahead and look at this. And behold, so this is when Jesus goes upon the Mount of Transfiguration. He brings his disciples with him. And look, and behold, there, and I chose this gospel specifically because it gives a little bit more information about this occurrence than some of the other ones. Behold, there talked with him two men, which were Moses and Elijah. It says Elias, but it's Elijah. Who appeared in glory and spoke of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. Now, is that, see, for me, whenever I read something like that, I'm like, wow. For some reason, see, G, you know what else that shows me? Jesus didn't know everything. D does that make sense? Like, in other words, it's important for you and I to understand that Jesus was a true human being. He never stopped being God, but he wasn't a little baby Jesus born. and was there. He saw it, all that in his pre-incarnate state. What are you trying to say? When he was the eternal word that spoke the world into existence before he clothed himself in human flesh. Why did he clothe himself in human flesh? So that he could die for you. So that he could die for your sin. Because the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. But my point is right here. Jesus is on his way, about to go to Jerusalem, and he still don't know the whole thing. And God's so loving, so merciful. Listen, he's going to do the same for you, my friend. You are his child. He loves you. And the Spirit of God lives in you. And God will warn you and prepare you for, and give you the strength that you need for no matter what you're going through. And look, they, got, they explained a little bit. They spoke with him of his decease, having a conversation. <laughs> Jesus is having a conversation with Elijah and Moses. And what he's going to have to accomplish at Jerusalem. So that's just, to me, an interesting concept. That the two people that God pulled back were, uh, were specifically Elijah and Moses, right? Now, what some people may say, and I'm okay with that too, that maybe the reason it was Elijah and Moses was because Moses was the author of the law and he was the author of the Old Covenant and that Elijah was, maybe you could say, the king of the prophets, meaning the ministry of Elijah was powerful. But I just wanted you... I wanted you to see that. All right. So I wanted you to see that. Now, now regarding Moses, let's just give a little bit more evidence that may not seal the deal for you. But to me, it's interesting. Look at this. Deuteronomy 34, 5 through 6. So Moses, I mean, if you go back and you read the rest of the first few verses, it's very interesting. It says, so Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. If you go back and you read the first few verses, the interesting that celestial beings didn't know. They're watching the whole thing, my friend. You understand that? Do you understand that, the, that celestial beings are watching this whole thing played out like a video on art? What are you talking about? Angels, principalities, powers, spiritual wickedness. They're watching this whole thing play out on earth. The Bible says that when a person gets saved, the angels of God look into it. They're watching. They watch this too. How do you know? Because I'm going to tell you all I know right here in this next scripture. You ready? Jude. Jude tells us something, and look, he looks like he's, quote, he's quoting out of, an, uh, out of another book. He, he, the, the story goes back to 1st Enoch. So th there you go. It's not, and I'm not trying to tell you that 1st Enoch should be in the Bible. I don't believe that. But that's some powerful stuff whenever a biblical writer quotes it. Yeah. Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. Now that's a strange thing. Right? I mean, look, you know, I was listening to, to some guy that a vet turned me on to the other day. Uh, his name is Dr. Michael Heiser. And he said, I love weird stuff. And when you, he's talking about in the Bible. I love weird stuff. And when you come across weird stuff, it's important. Right? So when you read something like that, your brain ought to say, wait, what? I never saw that before. Wait, what? Michael, the archangel, fighting or contending, at least, with the devil. They were in a disputation over what? The body of Moses. What are you talking about? Why are y'all fighting over this body? I, I don't, I, I don't know. Durst not bring, look, but he, what he's saying is Michael durst not bring a rail, him a railing accusation, but says the Lord rebuked thee. I think that's one good point to make is that, you know, let me not get off my, my beaten trail, but back whenever, before I understood the finished work of Christ, back before I understood to put my faith in what Christ has already done for me, and that if I would just trust in that victory of Jesus, that the Holy Spirit would flow into my life and give me victory. You know what my faith was in before that? Rebuking the devil. 
I mean, listen, you can turn. Like, I'm not telling you don't rebuke the devil. Don't, don't put words in my mouth. I didn't say that. You can re re rebuke him when he tries to come again. But you got to understand something. You can't turn rebuking the devil into the opposite. Yeah. No, even the archangel Michael knew the Lord rebuked thee, Satan. Yeah, that's good. The power is in the Lord. But look, why are they disputing over the body of Moses? Yeah. Is it because God's doing something different than he ever did it before? Because he's God? <laughs> so let's see where else we got to go. I'm about to close. And when they have finished their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. That's talking about the two witnesses. Now, one of the things that hit me, and I hope that one day, I don't want you to be cursed with the weight of my brain things, but I hope that one day you will not pass up things that stick out to you once you know the Bible better. Now, right there, we've already learned about the abyss, the bottomless pit. I went into detail. You may not remember, but I showed you that the bottomless pit means abyss. I broke down the word. I showed it to you on the screen. I don't know if you remember that. I hope you do. But then it's talking about the beast. Now, yeah, maybe some of you haven't learned this yet, but y'all know who the beast is? Y'all know who the beast is? We're about to get to it. We're gonna, we'll, we'll, we'll talk to it really in de detail in Revelation 17. Well, really, Revelation 13. Who's the beast? The beast is the Antichrist. The beast is a system. The beast is a man. Well, how, how the beast that sends out the bottomless pit? There was a man down there? <laughs> no, somehow, some way. I mean, I don't mean to break it down too much. But what I will say is this, is that what did come out the bottomless pit was we know of one angel at least, and we know of a bunch of demon spirits, right? And what I'm trying to say is, is that the beast, you know, one thing too, the beast, the beast is going to be a man that's going to be possessed. I believe, I, I personally believe by Satan. I can't find a scripture that says it specifically. It does say that Satan entered into Judas. But I will tell you this, that the, that Satan and his work is going to be inside of the Antichrist. And it says the dragon gives him his power. And you know what I was thinking too? That when this bottomless pit is open, when this trumpet is blown, what was that trumpet three? I could be wrong, but I think it's trumpet three. And, that, and they unlock that pit, remember that? And, it, and all them demons come out. Man, can you imagine what it's going to be like then? And the power that Satan, like you think he's got power now. Can you imagine the power he's going to have then? Somebody was talking to me about that CERN thing the other day. Who told me about that? Somebody. It was like the first time they'd ever heard of it. CERN and that all them arms of Shiva thing. Y'all y'all ever heard? Y'all watch any videos yeah. on that? Oh, I checked out Collider. Yeah, that that, that. and so what they're why did I even bring that up? Because they're saying that they opened up some black hole and that it brought demons on the earth. Okay. But guess what? Even if that's true, and that's whenever we saw things getting worse. I don't know. Maybe it's true. But I do know one thing, it has gotten worse, but guess what? It's going to be a whole lot way worse at this point, right? So anyway, they're going to overcome them, and, and, and their dead bodies shall lie in the street called Sodom in Egypt. I'm going to, like I said, I promised you I would stop there. I'm going to stop there, but we're going to pray real quick. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we just thank you, Lord, for your word. I pray for the people that are in this room tonight, Lord, each and every one of us, Lord. Maybe there's someone here that has never received you as their Lord and Savior. One of the things that I've learned is that whenever you start knocking on the door of our heart, whenever we start hearing the word of God, the enemy also tries to pull us away. Father, in the name of Jesus, you're, there's a parable that says that the seed of the gospel, that the fowl of the air, which is a type of, the, of Satan, tries to steal the seed. The seed is the word of God. I pray right now in the name of Jesus, Lord, that you would protect the seed of your gospel in the hearts and lives of everyone, whether they're saved or not, Lord, I'm asking you to do it. Protect that word, Lord, that was spoken, Lord. Those that watched on video, those that are in here tonight, pr protect that word, Lord. Let it not be stolen by the enemy. Let us remember, Lord God, that you always had a witness in the land. Let us remember that there's two types of people on the earth, those that are with you and those that are against you, oh Lord God. Let us be reminded, Lord, that there's a spirit in this world that is trying to make your truth look irrational, trying to make your truth seem silly, seem uncool. The world thinks the world visions you as uncool, Lord God. But you're you're the most powerful, 
awesome thing, Lord, and you love us so much, Lord God. I pray that you'd make that real. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would seal every heart and every mind. I pray, Lord God, that you would make us witnesses, Lord. I pray that our heart would be broken like a man in sackcloth, Lord, and that we would be witnesses for you and that our minds would be reminded that souls hang in the balance. I pray, Lord God, that you would cause in our hearts a thankfulness to rise up, that we would be reminded of where we used to be, those of us that are saved and those of us that have seen you change our hearts and lives. Lord, we're not perfect, but Lord God, we love you. And I pray that you would cause our heart to be overwhelmed with thankfulness because of what you've done. And I pray that you minister and protect your people in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Jesus.